You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by iWokeUp, flexible loans built for small businesses. Today, we are in Budapest. <laughs> Where are we, Lionel? We are in Budapest. Well, virtual Budapest. At the start of the very first virtual Grand Tour that the Cycling Podcast has ever covered. The 2020 question. Giro d'Italia. Uh, I've got a question, Napalm. 40 seconds into our virtual... Um, or our Giro. Are we in Buda? Or Remember are we the in branding, Pest? guys. Remember the branding. <laughs> Are we in Buda or are we in Pest? I've got my left foot in Buda and my right foot in Pest. I'm straddling the Danube. Do you know which is do you do you know which is which? Well, Buda comes first. Do you know which is which? Pest comes second. Well, well, we're starting <laughs> our prologue as the the actual 2020 Giro's prologue was supposed to start in Pest, which if you're looking at Budapest, it's the the right bank Rive Dwat. I mean, Pest, B- Pest Buddha really sounds more like a sort of a, a bothersome spiritual being. <laughs> it doesn't work at all, does it? <laughs> no. So listen, what's coming up in stage one from our Giro? Uh, we will be with you nightly for the next three weeks as we travel around well, starting off in Hungary and and going to Italy. In tonight's first episode, we have interviews with Italian authors and historians and, in fact, also Daniel's former professors, John Foote and John Dickey, and also the director of the other Giro d'Italia, Mauro Vegni. Um, and we'll hear from him. We're, we're looking... Uh, we're looking back at the 1946 Giro, the Giro of Rebirth, and, and ahead, I suppose, to when the when we get the Giro once again. We'll also have a, a nightly slot, will be Amacor, where we reach into the, the vaults of the Cycling Podcast and pull out a favourite clip from a, an episode where we've been at the Giro. Uh, we'll have a wine of the day. And well, two, two, two of us will have a wine of the day. I'm not sure if you've got any left. I mean, that's the that's the first scandal. That's the first scandal of the of the Giro. I mean, we've had editions of the Giro before when we've, um, you know, been talking of drugs raids and you know, I've been wine, race I've been wine doping. Wine who's gonna doping. Be, who's going who's gonna to be chucked off the race for a dodgy hematocrit? Um, well, we might have one podcaster chucked off for a dodgy blood alcohol level well, before we've even yeah. left Budapest. A transfusion of red wine. Fantastic. Uh, we're also, in this episode, the first episode, counting down to Stacey Snyder's Giro-themed cycling podcast, Mugs and Cappuccino Cups, going on sale. They will go on sale as soon as this episode finishes, assuming that you're listening to it as soon as it's released. Um, at the end of the episode, I'll tell you how to try and get one. And uh, proceeds from the Mugs and Cups are going to the Scuola Ciclismo in Cheney near Bergamo, a cycling school for young children there in one of the areas hardest hit by the coronavirus crisis so at the end of the the show i'll give you details about how to try and get one of the the cups or the mugs but before that as tradition dictates uh, the tale of the tapa please lionel well thank you richard yes we are in budapest for the opening time trial of the giro 8.5 kilometers starting in hero square and running along the banks of the danube and with a final climb of around 1.5 kilometers with an average gradient of four percent finishing up near the castle um it's a uh, traditional start to a grand tour and it's going to sort sort us all out men from boys see who's in the pink jersey who's in the black jersey as last on uh, general classification i think in this virtual giro our giro we ought to revive that old tradition of the giros having the but, the uh, the black jersey and, and black and black suits you lionel it does it's very slimming yes indeed um i'm, I'm just gonna make the digs myself you know save you the effort Richard, <laughs> sorry, sorry. over the course of these three weeks they're all scripted i'm sure <laughs> Well, let's cross over to the course in Budapest to find out how our two protagonists have got on in the opening time trial. Oh, dear. Prologue finished. 15.14.979 15.14.979 for I think 8.3 kilometres 
that was a hard climb at the end really steep in places but I made it day one is done now just hope I beat Lionel Well, I stopped the clock in a little over 20 minutes. Uh, no real challenge to Richard today, uh, but I was just pootling along, uh, keeping my powder dry for the longer stages to come. Well, Richard, I rather rashly promised in last week's episode that I would ride all of the stages of our Giro. I'm still intending to do that. I'm off to a start. Uh, same here. I'm hoping to do that too. Well, let's see. I mean, we we put this on public record now. Uh, the listeners will pull us up as soon as... Um, I climb into the virtual broom wagon. Um, but if you fancy joining us riding our Giro, you can do so. The stages are on the RGT app. Go to rgtcycling.com for all of the information. You can also go to thecyclingpodcast.com slash our Giro to find out how to sign up and join in with our... Uh, well, we're, everyone will be wearing pink jerseys in the peloton in our Giro. Each stage will be online for three days, so you don't have to keep up um, every single day. And you can drop in and out if you wish. You can. Uh, it's a bit like the, the Challenge Mallorca. Uh, but Daniel, you're our race director. You've designed the route. Um, it looks pretty challenging to me. I've had a. I haven't looked too far ahead, taking it day by day. Um, but even the early <laughs> stages. <laughs> All the cliches already. Brilliant. <laughs> even the early stages look quite challenging to me. Well, they are challenging, uh, Napalm. We decided that we were going to design our own Giro, our Giro. Um, and it, it was going to be on the basis of what what had already been presented as the 2020 Giro route. Um, not least because we had some cracking hotel um, bookings already made for that. Can I, I want to at least virtually visit some, revisit or visit um, some of them. Um, so, you know, we wanted to go to some of the same locations. So we decided to stay in in um in hungary for the grande partenza i was also very curious about hungary um because it's not a place i've been to before rich wanted us to start there because um it's it's one of the countries um whose language i do not speak so he wanted to embarrass me he wanted the the pronunciation carabinieri to be out in force straight away <laughs> um but the, you know there are there are some there is there are themes as well to my um to to my Giro route, our Giro, and one of my them, Giro which we're going to be, already. well, yeah, <laughs> our Giro, Daniel, remember, <laughs> we're going to be discussing some of them in this first episode, and one of them is is rebuilding um, and and rebirth, and um, as I think everyone knows, Italy has been terribly affected by the COVID nineteen crisis, and. Um, Italy is a country who, well, whose recent history is punctuated by um, disasters, natural disasters, crises, economic and political crises, and there are there are not there are several nods um, to these themes in my route. So um, <laughs> my route. Uh, <laughs> my route. Am I allowed to call it my route? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Can we can can we can we settle <laughs> on that? Um, Earthquakes um, have been, uh, unfortunately, a theme in um, in modern Italian history and, and going back even further. I mean, probably the worst earthquake ever in Italian history was in um, 1693 in Sicily. So bad that, uh, I mean, it, it really defies belief. And 20,000 people lived in Catania at the time, um, one of the major cities in Sicily. 16,000 died, so there were 4,000 left after that. And, um, you know... Earthquakes, well, we all remember the earthquakes in 2016-2017 um, in the centre of Italy. There's a, I've got a time trial that um, is a sort of um, homage to the people of that region. Um, we're visiting Bergamo. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot there that, that will be quite poignant, I think. But just to clarify for any listeners who are suddenly worried that the virtual journey around Italy for our Giro will just be me and Richard talking about riding the 30-ish kilometres of each day's ride, race. Some of them will be races, I think, won't they? We're, some of these details are, are yet to be revealed. The, ro the road book is uh, going to be filled in as we go along, it seems. Um, not all of the rules are in place already. Um but we're not going to be reporting on the uh, virtual riding, are we, Richard? We're going to be telling it's lots going to of be stories a from... pretty small element. Yeah, I think we've got lots of interviews lined up with stars of past Giri to tell some of the great stories of the Giro. 
You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by IWOCAP, flexible loans built for small businesses. IWOCA.co.uk We're very pleased to be sponsored by IWOCA and we wouldn't have been able to create this, our virtual Giro, without their support. IWOCA specialise in lending to small businesses and at the moment they are very busy helping to support small businesses that are struggling with uh, the coronavirus crisis. They can lend between £1,000 and £250,000 and applications take only a few minutes. They promise a fast and fair decision. But to hear more about IWOCA, let's hear from their Chief Operating Officer. Hi, I'm Seema and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at IWOCA. There's a couple of things that we're doing at the moment um, to try and help small businesses. We're getting behind a grassroots campaign um, that was actually started by small businesses for small businesses. Uh, it's called Stock Up Small. Uh, so the aim is to get consumers to stock up small and support local small businesses. So there's a great website that is an amazing resource of like small businesses that are still doing kind of deliveries and to customers through through the crisis and uh, yeah we're trying to direct consumers to to the directory so yeah it's called stock up small stick it in your web browser do an internet search and uh, yeah it'll come up there are some amazing businesses out there that are still serving customers through all of this so yeah do, do take a look and and, um, and support them. That was Seema Desai of iWaka. And if iWaka sounds like the perfect fit for your small business, go to iwaka.co.uk. That's iwoca.co.uk. Amar Korda. I remember... I'm going to wear my captain's armband every time we're on air podcasting. <laughs> just, to, just so that you guys know who's Age in charge. Richard today? Yeah. I are, am an age today. are you older than Jean Christophe Perrault, who I think I discovered today is going to be the oldest ever, or is the oldest ever Giro d'Italia debutant? He's going to be 39 when the race finishes. Yeah, I'm a little older than him, uh, about the same age as Jens Vocht. The, the big question is, though, Rich, when you leave the race, who are you going to give the, the captain's armband to? Well, I'll, I'll toss it to the ground as I, as I uh, <laughs> stomp off. off the pitch, and <laughs> it'll you? be up to one of you guys to pick it up. As the birthday boy, are you also de facto peddler de charme? We didn't do peddler de charme. We're going to do it tomorrow, aren't we? No, well, we said we'd start it in Italy. Maybe we should start it tomorrow. We could do. Anyway. Uh, I mean, hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we finish with the birthday stuff, uh, what about a little rendition, guys? Come on. (laughs) Oh, come on. (laughs) At the end, maybe we can... In Italian? Can can you... Okay. All right. Tanti auguri a te. No, that's enough. Maybe we can play play us out at the end of the episode. We always need to give people something to carry on listening for. I think that will mm. be sufficient. If you guys could play out this episode with a, a rendition of Happy Birthday, that'd be great. I think, aren't there really quite controversial rights issues over the use of <laughs> Happy Birthday? Well, chaps, that was a little clip from the opening weekend of the 2016 Giro in the Netherlands. Do you remember heady that? Days. Heady, heady days. Heady days. I was going to say heady days. Absolutely. That's the, that's the phrase that came to mind listening to that. Heady, bo- boozy days, slightly. A bit. That was well, a bit it was, boozy, wasn't it? It was Richard's birthday, of course. Special that was actually the, f- the first time that we covered the Giro daily for the podcast, if you remember. So we were, well, we were high on life, weren't we? And uh, it was Richard's birthday, and we were in a very busy town square Not, in yeah. Nijmegen. Not high enough on life to sing me happy birthday, however. Lionel. Well, this kicked off a, a, a controversy that has run for, well, ever since, really. But I had read a long article in something like the New Yorker or the New York Times about a decades-long wrangle over the rights to happy birthday. And if you watch a film, uh, any film where there's a kind of birthday scene, you'll, you'll never see them actually sing happy birthday because the rights were too expensive. So I didn't want to bankrupt the podcast by uh, singing happy birthday without permission. What, uh, what I'd misunderstood was that actually the, uh, the rights had lapsed and that the song had just basically come into the public domain a matter of weeks before. So I was perhaps being a little overcautious. This was, not, this was not, peak, not paying peak. enough not, not not paying enough attention to your long read in the New Yorker yeah, there, show off. This was what? peak <laughs> nervous napalm. Honestly, in this episode we've got Daniel's professors and Lionel reading long articles in the New Yorker, honestly. <laughs> uh, in this game of one up mentions. So so now it's not an issue and it was of course my birthday again two days ago. So hopefully you can more play importantly this more importantly, Marcel Kittel won the stage that day. He did. He did. Um It but, was a great uh, weekend, wasn't it? It was a real festival weekend. Well, 
what I remember most about that weekend, which seems quite poignant now, are the crowds. They were phenomenal. Um, really, it was a real I, festival atmosphere I also, there. T- talking about nervousness, I also remember the, the, the great anxiety on the part of RCS. Um, I, I was speaking to some of our friends at RCS um, on a few days before the start of the race, and they were quite concerned because they'd arrived, and as they do, um, probably a, a week or so in advance to set everything up for the Grande Partenza, and they didn't see that much evidence that it was going to be very grande, very gr- grand, and um, it all just came alive um, a, a day or two before the actual start itself, and it was pretty memorable. Anyway, I'm a chord, uh, Daniel. What does this word mean? Well, it is a, a word from Romagnolo, um, so the Romagna region of Italy, so that's where Marco Pantani was from, um, but it is also where Federico Fellini, the most the most famous Italian film director of all time, was from, and it was the title of a Fellini film, Amar Cord, um, literally means I remember, and Amar Cord was one of his famous films that won the um, best foreign film at the Oscars in 1973 or four, I think, um, I have to check that, but um, it's it's become a, a, a sort of neologism in the Italian language, it's a word that people use now to sort of mean any kind of trip down memory lane, any sort of, um, a, any sort of wistful, um recollection well we'll be delving into the cycling podcast vault every day won't we during this giro just to uh, remember some of the memorable moments we'll be taking our own little trips down memory lane um and got, we've got a few belters i think they'll, they'll not memories yeah they'll not all be fueled by alcohol and uh, speaking of alcohol speaking of alcohol cheers chaps salute chin chin Cheers. Your glass appears empty, Richard. Vino del giorno. Chin chin. Kicking off the Giro d'Italia podcast, we've got the Frippmann 2016 Keck Francoche, which is a dry raspberry type of flavoured wine that sort of has a, has a nice back end spice without being too heavy. A wine like this is perfect for going with your roast beef, possibly things like a beef casserole or a game casserole something that's not going to dominate the dish but equally is is man enough to stand up to it so that was greg andrews from divine cellars there our wine partner um, for this giro d'italia and greg and i have been selecting well we've we initially selected 12 wines which uh, correspond to locations in our giro we've got a couple of hungarians in there kicking off today with the Frittman Kek Frankos, what do you make of it, chaps? Red. Oh, I mean, I thought it'd be a, a lovely, evocative description. Lovely red garnet colour there, Richard. The sort of sour cherry that just hits your mouth. Like it, it reminded me of Montmorency cherries. Have you ever had those, chaps, from Canada? Sa- very sour cherries. Um, no. Yeah, I kind of expected it to be uh, lighter than than it is. It's it's quite dry, isn't it? Um, but fruity. Very full-bodied. Uh, I would say... A bit like Lionel. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's that full-bodied. Vo- bodied. I would say it's very medium to light-bodied, oh, Richard. I um, take, a, good, take a punt at that. <laughs> good, good acidity. Um, but anyway, the, the most important thing is that our listeners can, can accompany us on this journey around Italy by buying our Selezione Argiro, so our Giro selection, 12 bottles. Um, Greg Anderson at Divine Sellers is selling them for £200, 12 bottles, um, retail price £215, and um, £10 for every case goes to the Scuola Ciclismo di Cene, um, the cycling school in Bergamo that we've already mentioned. And there's also a baby Giro case, slightly more affordable, six bottles for £88. Again, there'll be a donation made um, to the Scuola Ciclismo in Cene, and those cases can be delivered anywhere in the UK. Um, So look out for the information on how you acquire that wine in our show notes. He he wears his expertise very lightly, doesn't he, our Daniel? Hey, Rich? Mm, I thought you were going to say me. Uh, my my, day, my wine notes every day are just going to be the color and the percentage. Well, I was given. I was, <laughs> I was given forty seconds. We we red, allocated red, forty 13%. seconds. I had to, I had to, I had to be, almost wrap through um, everything I wanted to say about the wine. But anyway, there will be hopefully more detailed descriptions in, in, coming, anyway, in the coming days. 
Back onto the Giro Chaps. It's Saturday the 9th of May. The 103rd Giro d'Italia should have been starting in Budapest. It's not because of coronavirus, which has shut down Europe, having hit Italy first and very, very hard. Um, this meant the Giro was one of the first international sporting events to be called off. It still might be held in October. We dare to dream, but we just don't know. And so we are facing up to a May without the Giro for the first time since the Second World War. In this, our first episode from our Giro, we're reflecting on this fact by looking back to the last Giro of Rebirth, as it was called. The 1946 race was the first since 1940 when Fausto Coppi upstaged his teammate, Gino Bartoli. Bartoli was furious and would remain so for the rest of his life. Um, that, of course, foreshadowed a great rivalry, the greatest rivalry Italian cycling has ever seen um, between Coppi and Bartoli. And in '46 they faced off again, and this time it was the older man, Bartoli, who won. We will be telling the story of Coppi and Bartoli and their rivalry in a future episode from our Giro. In this one, we're going to look at what it meant for the Giro to return, how important it was, symbolically, if nothing else, and later to look at how important it is that the Giro does return this year, next year, or whenever the health situation improves enough to make it safe. In 1946, Italy was a broken country, having come out of two wars, the World War and the Civil War, which had wrecked much of its infrastructure, including its roads. About two-thirds of that 46 Giro was not on asphalted roads, but gravel, dirt or Strada Bianchi. Attempting to hold the race at all was a massive gamble, but it was considered worth it. As Gazzetta della Sport put it, it would enable the Italian people to rediscover themselves thanks to their irrepressible optimism. Um, Alfredo Martini, the legendary Italian coach, said that racing the 46 Giro was a positive, emblematic thing. People understood that Italy had to start from nothing, roll up its sleeves and also to think of things that would provide enthusiasm and reignite passion. The Giro offered hope for the future. Uh, Daniel, it's maybe a bit crass to draw too many parallels between war and the pandemic, but what can you tell us about the 1946 Giro and how important it was for Italy and for Italians to feel a sense of normality returning? Well, I think the first thing to say, Rich, is that we we chose this as our first theme to to visit to sort of set us off on this journey because that the parallel has already been drawn between what will be the 2020 Giro we hope and the 1946 Giro and you know just preparing for this episode today um uh, uh, that's and, and doing a bit of research on the 46 Giro it really brought home you know how many parallels there are and and, and above all the sense of a world um, a sort of a broken jigsaw puzzle that was um, that had to be put back together in a way that people didn't really understand and was sort of making up as they go along. And, and you know, that's been a theme throughout Italian history that they've constantly been rebuilding. I mentioned the sort of disasters earlier and, um, you know, political and economic disasters. And, you know, I often say to uh, my Italian friends and, um, you know, this is a bit of sort of fag packet psychology but I always say to them you know the Italians are great in crisis because they live their lives in a state of current uh, of constant sort of emergency and drama it's when they're most comfortable and and um, you know that that's probably more than a cliche and in fact you know my Italian friends kind of agree with me when I say that um, there's a quote from a famous Italian journalist um, Roberto Gervaso um, who says that the, the Italian um, doesn't get organized he gets by and, and that really sort of sums it up. But um, as I was saying about 1946, I mean, I was just looking through the, the, the newspapers um, and the, the coverage of that 46 year. And, and just looking at the other things that were going on in the world at that time, you know, the, um, the Americans testing the, an atomic bomb on Bikini Island. Um, I didn't know Bikini Island was a real place, but it was. Um, and, and that was really, you know, that, that sort of brought home that it, it, the, the Cold War really started on those same days when um you know the the giro peloton this sort of makeshift motley giro peloton was was sort of picking its way through the rubble of, of and, and and they went to trieste where which was right on the frontier of the cold war um close to yugoslavia and and there was a real a, a sense of you know uncertainty in that part of the world in particular and and you know the right the the stage was disrupted wasn't it when they when they went there, only 17 riders made it to Trieste. Uh, Coppi and Barty were among those who didn't make it to the finish that day because 
they were basically attacked on their way to Trieste. Yeah, an extraordinary situation in uh, Trieste. So that's, um, if you can picture Italy, uh, the boot of Italy, um, sort of behind, I was behind the, the calf muscle or, or the, behind the knee, really. Um, if you imagine this, Italy is a knee-high boot. Um, and it, so it's right on the border now with Slovenia. But yeah, at the end of the war, it was a contested territory and it was sort of split into zones in the same way that Berlin was in the same way that Vienna was and um, it, it it had been penciled in to the Giro route but um, they didn't know when the Giro started whether they were going to be able to go there or not and at, on the very day that the Giro was supposed to go to Trieste they didn't know whether they, they were going to be getting sorry they didn't know whether they would get into the city or not and in fact they ended up being sort of ambushed, the, the riders being ambushed um, 40 kilometres away from Trieste by, um, well, depending on which newspaper you read, it was either fascists um, or it was Slovenians, Yugoslavians, um, an uprising against the Allies, a protest against the, the Giro and the sort of nationalistic message that they believed that it was trying to, it was trying to carry with it. Well, let's hear from a couple of experts, um, John Dickey and John Foote, uh, Italian historians, professors and authors. Um, John Foote is also the author of Pedalari, Pedalari, which is a fantastic history of Italian cycling, really rich in detail. Um, so let's hear first from John Dickey on the subject of, as Daniel mentioned, um, the, uh, the regularity in Italy with which they're faced with disaster and having to sort of, uh, you know, come back from... from um, awful situations and then John Foote on that 1946 Giro d'Italia the Giro of Rebirth with John Foote I published a book on disasters in Italian history some years ago an edited volume and I wrote a book about um, Italy's worst earthquake disaster the 1908 Messina earthquake um, and it, 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 it's not comparable to those kinds of you know each disaster has its own particular nature and earthquakes are very different to, to epidemics and all, all that kind of stuff but one thing that is common to epidemics in Italian history and may well be common elsewhere is they generate they're perceived as a kind of world turned upside down and they generate this hopeful sense that somehow everything will be different afterwards, that we'll all be better people, that we will, um, you know, uh, solve some of the, you know, what are often assumed wrongly to be, you know, features of the Italian national character or whatever it might be. And it never, ever turns out to be true. <laughs> So I don't know. I'm, it, it makes me very, very loath to make predictions um, because so much depends on politics and political decision making. And that's, you know, that shifts very um, uh, frequently and, and uh, it depends on the skill, political skill of the people involved and all kinds of other factors. So I'm um, all just saying that, that makes me loath to uh, make predictions. I think it was very important. The, the, people wanted to get back to normality after 45. There have been five years of war. Uh, Italy had been a battlefield. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have died, have been deported, have, have been bombings all across Italy. So the idea that you could get back to watching the Giro, reading about the Giro, not really watching it, watching it outside your house, that's the only place you could watch it, but um, reading about it, listening to it on the radio was, was very important. They returned to normality and not thinking about, you know, fascists against anti-fascists, but thinking about Bar Bartolin Coppi. So I think it was really important. Um and the fact that they ran it in this completely mad um, situation of basically, you know, bridges down and um, rubble and they went past, you know, places that have basically a year before have been, people have been being killed left, right and centre. Um, and they went to Trieste and, and, and we could, you know, that story in itself is, is, is really interesting. So I think it was important. Obviously, it takes on mythological aspects um, and is exaggerated. 
by by um by journalists and by by historians as well and by the ordinary people that it didn't replace um social tension it didn't get rid of the cold war in fact it kind of was a mirror onto the cold war a lot of the riders were communists um you know they they, they were some of them had been partisans most of them had some sort of war experience um so that was all fascinating and you kind of kind of read through but it didn't it didn't like end all that it kind of was a, was a way of understanding that. And um, that's what makes it so interesting. But of course, it is the, it is the great copy Barsi rivalry. And it, it really begins there. Um, you know, of course, it begins back in 40. But this is, this is the moment, you know, it's, it's them too. And, uh, and it's very close. And so I think that really, that really did um, take, pick up the public imagination and everyone had to decide what side they're on. And it's a great, it's a great Giro for, for writers because it's got so many good stories in it. I don't think it's been done properly, actually. I think there's lots more to be said about it. If people want to go and do research, read the newspapers, um, there's tons of other stuff to be done on it. Um, that's true of all cycling, actually. There's so many stories out there. You could just take some of the individual riders, you know, and do some of their stories. So I think there's a lot more to be to researched into it. Obviously, it has been incredibly important for this this crisis because it's the first place after China where the disease took hold, uh, and in places that probably people wouldn't expect. Um, you know, it's kind of overturned a lot of cliches. Um, Italy um, was a place where you've got to had a lot of earthquakes, a lot of disasters, two world wars fought on Italian soil. You know, it's a place that has kind of had to rebuild itself, as you say, many times. And, and from really positions of absolute sort of the year zero, certainly 45, but maybe even 1918. Um, so, you know, it, as you say, I think that isn't a cliche. I think it's true that they are and, and they've been going through a long economic crisis worse than in many other countries. Um, but, you know, the, the fact that they, they were the first um, and they had to live through it before everybody else, I think will be very important to the rest of the world to understand what happened. And I, one of the things I'm going to do is is actually do some studies on on how Milan and, and, and Bergamo reacted. I think you do have a role of sport here as well, because there's, there's quite a lot of theories going uh, around. That they haven't been proved, but that the Atalanta-Valencia game um, was an actual, people have called it a... Um, a bomb, you know, that was put in the middle of the disease. 40,000 people from Bergamo going to Milan for a Champions League game at the key moment of the infection. Um, and, you know, we'll see in years to come whether that was very important. But if it was, it was it's a fascinating thing, I think. Um, and I think that the Giro, once things like the Giro, the Giro is so important to it too because it's an annual event. It's It takes place across the country um, it, it, you know, it, 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 it explains it, it, over in, in the past, it's kind of explained Italy's geography to itself. And it's a ritual. And there aren't many rituals like that, um, that, that, that happen every year at the same time. Of course, it won't be the same time this year. So it is very important, even, even if it's not quite as enormous as it was in the 40s and 50s. So I think that one of the signs of the return to normality will be something like the Giro starting up again and people the rituals that people understand even if they don't follow it they understand that there's been the Giro somebody's won it it's gone through here it's gone through there it's gone up the mountains it's gone to the plains and so on there's one other thing actually which I was thinking in my brain you know there was a cholera outbreak in Naples in 1973 so that is in living memory you know this is not and, and actually Neapolitans often are called colorozzi by other fans and this kind of overturns a lot of that stuff you know it's Milan is the place and and it's strange you know Milan is meant to be modernity so it's this idea that this is a disease that hits modernity is an interesting one but that that's for another that's for another podcast I think probably I think listening to the two Johns there and thinking about our current predicament the comparison between 46 and now is that when the Giro does um, you know, does get put on, whether that's in October this year or if it's postponed to next year, there will be a sense of tentative footsteps, won't they? Everyone kind of emerging into the light quite tentatively, um, especially, well, one of the things we talked about in the UK media about why did the coronavirus kind of 
um, hit Italy so hard and, and the sense of, of generations living together, uh, people being much more tactile when they meet each other in the street. You know, these are obviously, you know, the speculations, but, um, you know, Italy, the sense of community and the, that you pick up even when you're traveling around the country following the race is something that you, you really sort of notice everyone coming out of their houses and, and joining together to watch the Giro go by. And it was interesting hearing John Foote talking about how even for people who aren't interested in cycling the giro is to them may it, it's a part of the year that 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 marks progress it, it's the sort of beginning of the summer um the, the heat isn't yet at its fiercest there's a kind of the, the the last kind of freshness of spring is still just about in the air and of course the weather can be changeable and um it, it will be really interesting whether the character of the race is altered as a result of being held in october or whether it will still feel like uh, the giro d'italia and um yeah i mean it's hugely symbolic for the country isn't it and it must have been in 1946 as well and i wonder how well, important it was that they had a fantastic race between uh two riders who came to split the country in two almost it's what's interesting about it is it's very easy to be dismissive of our you know christening it the, the giro of rebirth and we've had a few tours of rebirth and it's it normally feels like a kind of a commercial slogan rather than a, a, an authentic thing but but actually you know that was a, a giro of rebirth and you know the, the country had been at war for six years so there'd been this this huge gap but also when we look back on it now um from today's perspective it was the start of a golden age of cycling in italy and actually in, in europe but in, in italy with with copy really on on the edge on the verge of greatness and and a real a golden period in in Italian and, and European cycling wow. did follow, and, and um, not after forty six, and not just Italian cycling, Rich, but Italian life. I mean, the next forty years, as we will discuss in a, in a, another episode of our Giro, were you know as good as it ever got and it has ever got for Italy um, economically as well. And I think you know it, it, often words like rebirth and well, in in this case um, relating to this Giro, rebirth and. Um, regeneration and reunification are used sort of interchangeably but I don't think um, it was about reunification um, I think it would be a mistake and it would be a it would be naive to think that you know Italy was united as the Trieste um, incident uh, underlined um, but what it did I, it kind of reinforced um, what was already um, good and bad about um, it being Italian. Um, you know, Italy has been a divided nation throughout its its history, and and Coppi and Bartoli. I think that's one of the reasons why it resonated so much that it sort of it was a microcosm of the very many divisions that there have always been and will probably continue to be um, in in the Italian spirit and Italian society. But I think w the one thing that the 96 Giro really did sort of crystallise and, and, and leverage was that, that, that kind of um, the resilience and the, and the hope that is also um, integral to the Italian spirit, I would say. Daniel, do you know how the country split in terms of support for Coppi and Bartoli? Was it geographic? Was it class? Was it urban against the countryside? Did 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 specific groups align with uh, one rider or the other, or was it m much more of a, a you know a sort of nebulous thing where it was just you preferred one or you preferred the other? Well, I, I think a lot is often made of the the religious um, dimension to it. Um, Gino Bartoli was a was a pretty devout catholic and um you know often often people emphasize the role that that played um i think one thing that is underestimated underplayed is is character um and bartali was a, a much more so gregarious and this is something that he held against copy um often in interviews he would refer to the fact that copy was a pretty uninspiring character at least um bartali thought so um he used to say that in the copy um household it was a good job they had uh, serse um fausto's brother because he was the only one that, that that would say anything that would make conversation um and, you know, Bartali as well was very opinionated, quite sort of truculent he became, um, especially as he got older. But that's something that people don't often talk about. But I, I often wonder whether um, the, the two respective riders resonated with certain groups of people f because of because of their character, because that is something that, that tends to play a role. 
Well, we will return to Copy and Bartley in a future episode. I mean, there's so much to say about about those two and their rivalry and what it said about Italy um, that we're going to, I think, spend a whole episode talking about that. Um, Shall we hear a reading uh, from a book by Dino Buzzati, a famous Italian writer who was dispatched to the 1949 Giro, uh, but his conclusions at the end of that race really resonate, I think, with what we're talking about today. Um, so we'll hear this in two parts. Part one, now. In, mezzo al fiume immenso di macchine che la troieri. in the middle of the immense tide of cars that ebbed slowly from the Monza Autodrome the day before yesterday, backlit by the setting sun's fading rays, it looked like a herd wreathed in dust that one sees in westerns. Here and there, lost in this gigantic chaos, some spots of vivid colour stood out. It was the racers, still wearing their jerseys and transfigured by the exertion. Some were perched in the team cars among the spare wheels. Others leaned out of a truck's rear window. And others were still on their bicycle saddles because no one in this throng had bothered to give them a lift. And so they had 15 kilometres of extra effort to complete the Giro, adding to 4,000 kilometres already done. They saw us, they saw our dusty car, our official nameplate, our sun-baked faces. We belonged to the same gang. Them and us, fragments of a small, fascinating world that was at last dispersing to re-enter the dullness of everyday life. We looked at each other with a sad, understanding smile, like soldiers returning from war who, in the hubbub of a big railway station, are immediately considered as brothers. During the Giro, we and the racers had remained virtual strangers. But now, no. Now all the others were strangers, and we instead were suddenly friends. We alone in that crowd could understand each other. Parties to a secret full of melancholy. For 19 days we had seen them gallop throughout the entire peninsula with great astonishment, their legs the sole source of energy, and we then watched them continue in the Alps on the climbs and descents right next to precipices. One hundredth of what the last of them had done would have crushed us even 20 years ago when we were young, and we would have been taken to the hospital for at least a month. What remained now of all this frightful labour? Had it produced anything? Nothing. Pure fatigue, then, offered in sacrifice to a senseless mania. And yet, as soon as these men proceeded, passing from city to city, the people, astonishingly, abandoned their business or their spade, jumped out of bed, came down from the remotest homesteads, travelled very long distances on foot, waited in the rain and the sun for entire mornings, and there they were, the people of all Italy, farmers, labourers, old salts, mothers, decadent old men, paralytics, priests, beggars, thieves, massed along 4,000 kilometres, and they weren't what they were the day before. A new, powerful feeling possessed them. They were laughing, yelling, the sorrows of life forgotten for a few instants. They were happy, without a doubt, and we can vouch for that here. They were happy, positively, and we can do it here with regular testimony. The Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport for their support of the cycling podcast. First supported us in 2016, the first time we went and covered the Giro in full. So we've got a long relationship with Science in Sport and we really appreciate their support. And they are offering 25% off to all our listeners with the code SISCP25. If you enter that at the checkout at scienceandsupport.com, you'll get 25% off. Quick reminder that um, at the end of this episode, Stacey Snyder's mugs, cycling podcast, Giro mugs and cappuccino cups will go on sale. Go to stacysnyder.com, S-T-A-C-Y-S-N-Y-D-E-R.com or her Etsy site, E-T-S-Y.com forward slash shop forward slash Snyder Ceramics to get your hands on one of those beautiful objects. Before the break there, we heard from uh, Dino Bozzati. Uh, well, not really. It was actually me reading Dino Bozzati. And a, me. A book that and me. And you. And you, Daniel. Yeah. Um, a book that we're going to talk about in a in a future episode because it's a, it's a cracking book. Um, and that was from the epilogue. And really, his summing up his thoughts on the Giro. We'll f- hear the second part of that a bit later on. But quite powerful sort of impressions of having spent three weeks following the Giro. Yeah, I, I think it was very powerful, Rich. Um, and we, we talked a minute ago uh, in relation to 
1946 about the symbolism of that juror and how it's still talked about by historians, sociologists, and um, you know it's kind of revered for the role it it played in rebuilding Italy. But it's something that maybe the Giro has has taken for granted um, in in more recent sort of stable times. It's its role that kind of um, dimension it has as a um, as a as a symbol of of Italy and as a force for Italy as well and a, a sort of unifying force or a galvanizing force or for whatever it may be and you know it maybe is taken for granted and I suppose that passage about um, that passage from Buzzati is is all about not taking the Giro um, for granted and how it is something to to be admired and cherished. Um, and a lot of it still resonates with me today. You know, what he talks about in terms of that sense of almost comradeship with the, the riders that isn't apparent during the race itself, but becomes so afterwards. Um, I, I certainly uh, could could relate to that. Um, and I think, you know, with the Giro missing this May, we we do all realise, you know, journalists, fans, riders, um, what, what it is that we're missing and how much we do value it when it when it's on without perhaps always realizing that um i mean daniel uh you have been working very hard the last few weeks putting together our giro and um, what what's that experience been like what's that taught you about i mean has it given you a an appetite for maybe becoming the giro director <laughs> oh, absolutely. one day yourself absolutely I richard mean, first not impossible you know first english speaking director of grant i can definitely see that you see speak, that happening do you speak english uh, yeah just just um <laughs> No, but I think um, I think I think what it's done for all of us, and we've all been working very hard. I hope um, assembling our features and our and our um, our content horrible word, but content for um, the next three weeks. And um, I think it's brought home to all of us how infatuated we all are with the the Giro, and um, how many fantastic stories it's thrown up, um, how much you know color and and vigor it brings to to bike racing and and um, what a fantastic country italy um is to to visit and to explore and to discover in any month of the year but particularly in may i mean i don't know about you guys but there have been times over the over the last few weeks it's as though you know my body doesn't just have its own you know body clock but a body calendar i can almost feel the sort of frissons um you know thinking um, that I'm going to be going to the Giro any day now and the, the kind of anticipation has sort of been, been building um, almost in a physiological sense, in a visceral sense over the last few weeks. I'm going to miss travelling around that your selection of uh, remote sort of farmhouses and uh, other hilltop accommodation that we typically go to during the Giro. I'm, I'm wondering whether I should try and recreate that at home, perhaps take myself off into the fields and just sit quietly just for a bit, you know, just to get, <laughs> to become at one with the, with the Daniel Freeb Giro experience. Yeah, and I, I get that free song every time a, a whiz air email drops into my inbox, reminding me, <laughs> reminding us we're not getting our, our money back of our of our still <laughs> still going apparently flight to uh, or still went flight to to Budapest. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, just Dan on the subject yeah, of Budapest, sorry, on, on the subject of Budapest, Rich, how's that lovely Hungarian wine that Fritman oh, Kek Frankos going very well, well? Very well. Like I do to, love a nice red wine of 15%. Oh I'm going <laughs> to, over the course of these three weeks, I'm going to try and tease you towards a slightly, just as, you know, I, I know <laughs> I can't, I can't employ strong arm tactics. It's futile to try today to indoctrinate you. Not, but not over, two meters over, distance. over three weeks, I'm going to try to tease out a little bit more insight than this. Uh, there's a lot more in there, Daniel. I'm just, you know, I'm holding it back. I'm, I'm holding it back. I'm so not even sure Richard knows race. that there are, there are three types of wine. Three, red, <laughs> red, white, and sparkling. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, Daniel, I think you've spoken to the other director of the Giro d'Italia. Presumably, quite an awkward interview, given that he perhaps feels rather threatened by you at the moment. Oh yeah, very much so, very much so. But Mauro Vegni, the director of the Giro, has been he's been a hard man to pin down over the last few days because um, obviously discussions have been taking place about when the Giro, when the 2020 Giro, or if the Giro is going to take place. Um, that is now set in, well it's not really set in stone, is it? It's sort of set in putty. Um, when it's going to take place, it should be, we think, from the, was it the 3rd of October 
to the 25th of October. Um, anyway, w- there is some clarity on that now, and uh, Maravenu was happy to talk to us about what he thinks the 2020 Giro will mean um, to Italians and to cycling when it finally rolls out. Sai, condensare cercando di tutelare degli eventi e cercando You know, di condensing everything eh. while trying to protect certain events and rescheduling others was really complicated. Complicated for everyone. There's no point trying to decide who are the heroes and who are the villains. Necessity is the mother of invention and you have to turn the necessity into a virtue. Obviously I'm sorry the last day of the Giro is going to clash with Paris-Roubaix. I would never have expected that. But to be honest, that disappointment aside, the most important thing from my point of view was to get going again. It was important to restart, also just to send that message, which for us Italians is vital now. We don't have much heavy industry, we have Ilva, the steel company, but not much else of that nature. Which is why tourism is hugely important for us. Our races happening again will be a message to the world that they can come back to Italy, because we're il bel paese, the beautiful country and because we can welcome them back with all the necessary measures to make sure that they can safely enjoy what we have to offer. We can get into the controversies or technicalities of it all, but frankly it doesn't interest me. I just want us to be on the road again. We were the first in Europe to be struck by a really acute outbreak of coronavirus, and I'd like to think that we can be the first to reboot. As far as racing in October rather than May goes, I don't see much difference if I look at the weather patterns over the last few years. You can get more clear days in May, but the problem posed by the snow is much greater then than in October based on the last few years. If it snows in May, it tends to fall on the layers that have already accumulated over the winter, and there's not a lot you can do about that. Whereas it's a lot easier to manage if you get a bad day in October. That's what the last few years have taught us anyway. Da quel punto di vista è anche più facile poterla gestire. Poi può capitare di tutto, però la storia degli ultimi anni dice questo. Even in recent years, the Giro hasn't fulfilled the same symbolic role as it did, for example, with the Giro della Rinascita in 1946 and that era generally. It's not for lack of desire on our part. We want to be ambassadors or testimonials for the rebirth of this country. Clearly, until a few days ago, this was a country with completely different priorities. It wasn't very focused on an event such as the Giro and what it could represent. Unlike other countries which turned big occasions of a similar nature into great promotional tools. That's something we've always lamented, always voiced to the government. And I don't just mean those currently in power, but going back through the ages. In my opinion, there's simply little appreciation of what the Giro could bring and represent for Italy. How it could show off our culture, our geography, our wine and gastronomy. We've tried to catalyse the government in so many ways and they've shown little interest. We've often maligned that, not least because very often regional politicians who have previously leveraged their territories through the Giro seem to lose their will when they get elected into national government. It's not that the Giro has lost contact with modern life or its mission. The reality is that its potential has been ignored. Now we hope the politicians finally grasp what an important role the Giro could play in getting the country back on its feet. Because we've always been open to putting what this country needs at any given time over technical considerations. We've always been willing. Now we hope that finally someone knocks on our door and says, OK, why not? That was Maravegni, the director of the Giro d'Italia. That's about all for the episode one from our Giro Um we're going to play out with the second part of the Dino Buzzati reading, and we're also going to hear from podcast favourite uh, Gianni Savio of the Androni team. Um, but what have we got coming up tomorrow, Lionel? Well, tomorrow we're going to focus on Hungary, aren't we? Um, which is where, well, where we are. We're, we're, we're in Hungary, virtual Hungary. The Giro was due to start in Hungary. And, uh, well, the pair of you have spoken to some Hungarians to get a sense of what the Giro start in Hungary would have meant. Um, and also, I'll be unveiling my first dish of the Giro. Uh, you're welcome to join me in, in my restaurant. Um, and we will be sampling a very popular Hungarian dish with the help of of Felicity Cloak, award-winning food writer who, uh, well, I've nicknamed her Forensic Felicity because um, she's quite a hard taskmaster. When when the 
the dish is finally served up, she spots floors from well, from a oh, safe this, distance. We, she, she, she and I should get on like a house on fire. <laughs> oh God! I think. Um, <laughs> I think. Well, another re- dinner party with Daniel and Felicity another Ford. another reason for um, for starting hungry for starting Argyra and hungry was that to de- delay my food related panic attacks by another three days. <laughs> I, I'm I'm following very authentic recipes, Daniel. Don't worry. It's going to be it's going to be a real flavour and taste of Italy. It, it makes a change for you to be sorry for me to be more nervous about the first few days of Jiro than you, Lionel. <laughs> True. Yeah, I think I was quite quite comfortable with the idea of Hungary. Normally, Sicily makes me nervous, but that's um, that's a whole other story, and we will get to that. That's we will, we will we'll, we'll, we're, to we're, that. we're working our way to Sicily. Let's wrap things up for tonight, chaps. Um, go and try and get your hands on the uh, Stacy Snyder uh, mugs or cappuccino cups. They will go on sale any moment now if you're listening as soon as this was released. We're going to play out with uh, Dino Bizzati, part two of the reading, and Gianni Savio. We are rich. We're going to hear from Gianni Savio. Um, some of the listeners will already have seen um, and, and heard this um, virtuoso performance by Gianni and his wife a couple of weeks ago. It was the um, it was the Italian one well, National Day of the, to celebrate the li- liberation from the Nazis, and um, it's traditionally celebrated with a, a rendition of Bella Ciao, um, a song which we're going to hear Gianni singing and we're also going to hear him before that um giving us his his current thoughts about how italy is going to emerge from um the current coronavirus crisis and and you know whether those parallels that we've drawn in this episode with 1946 stand up or not thank you daniel thank you one and thank you light and thank you lionel thank you see you tomorrow Il prossimo anno, in maggio, sarà dato. And next year in May, the starter will once more lower his flag. And again the year after that, and so on. Spring after spring, the enchantment will live on. Until the day, but will we still be alive, when reasonable people will say it is absurd to continue. By then, bicycles will have become rare, almost comical scrap metal, used by a few nostalgic maniacs. And voices will be raised, ridiculing the Giro d'Italia. No, don't give up, bicycle. By then we will probably be dead and buried. Copy will be an emaciated, shaking little grandfather unknown to the new generations. Other names will be shouted by the crowds. Do not yield, O divine bicycle, as Henri de Grange, the tour's patron, has said. If you were to surrender, it would mean the end, not only of an era in sports, a chapter in civilization, but also put an even greater restriction on what is left of the realm of illusion, where simple souls find relief. At the risk of seeming ridiculous, take off again on a cool May morning and travel the ancient roads of Italy. By then we will be travelling mostly by rocket trains. Atomic energy will be sparing us the least little effort. We will be extremely powerful and civilised. Pay no attention to us, bicycle. Just fly along with your frail strength by mountains and valleys. Sweat, strive and suffer. From his isolated alpine hut, the woodcutter will still come down to shout hurrah. Fishermen will climb up from the beach. Accountants will abandon their ledgers. The blacksmith will let the fire die so he can come to celebrate you. The poets, the dreamers, the good and the humble people, still sensitive to kindness, will still crowd the edges of the roads, forgetting poverty and hardship, thanks to you. And the young girls will cover you with flowers. Miserie estenti, e le ragazze ti copriranno di fiori. Sì, allora, il giro hai stabilito... Yes, there is a parallel with 1946, but also a paradox. I say a paradox because absolutely everything about a war is damaging, and the physical damage is a visual representation of that. But nevertheless, the Second World War did end. Italy, in particular, could turn a page. Whereas here, today, the enemy is an invisible one, and we can't even conceive of how or when the war will end. That's the worst thing about it. And I'm saying this as an eternal optimist. At the moment, though, I can't make any predictions, and not even the preeminent world experts can either. The comparison with 1946 is a good one, but part of me thinks this will be even harder. I also wouldn't be so bold as to say that the Italians are somehow innately wired to transcend these crises more so than other populations. 
Yes, it's true that the Italians have had to deal with and overcome massive adversity throughout their history, that they've shown remarkable character and determination. That's why I'm sure they, well, we, because I'm one of them, will succeed here too. E quindi io sono convinto che riusciranno anche, riusciremo, perché ci sono anch'io di mezzo. Sono convinto. Dai, vai. Una mattina mi sono svegliato, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Una mattina mi sono svegliato e ho trovato l'invaso. O oh partigiano, portami via. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Partigiano, portami via, che mi sento di morire. E se io muoio da partigiano, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Se io muoio da partigiano, tu mi devi seppellir. Mi seppellirai lassù in montagna, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. Mi seppellirai lassù in montagna. Sotto l'ombra di un bel fior. E la gente che passerà, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao. E alla gente che passerà, ti dirà, ti dirà, ti dirà, no, che bel fior. E questo è il fiore di un partigiano. Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 questo è il fiore del partigiano morto per la libertà. Viva la libertà! Viva la libertà!